the unification of Egypt. In this lecture, we shall cover the coming of Egypt as a unified empire, the snake and the hawk coming together as one. We'll also cover, cover ancient mythology and how it inspired later religions such and, and West, um, later religions and Western psychotherapy. Now, our story starts today with King Nama. At the time of King Nama's birth, geographically, Egypt was divided into two, Upper and Lower Egypt. Each had its own capital city and deity. The hawk god, Horus, represented Upper Egypt. Horus represented consciousness, good, and the sky. And you can see his eye today on the American dollar bill as the all-seeing eye of Horus. Lower Egypt's deity was Wajet, the snake goddess who represented their lands. Each area had its own culture, symbolism, and religious sects, which would later become unified under one leader. If you look closely at Egyptian leaders, you can detect as to whether they come from Upper or Lower Egypt, and whether this was before or after the unification of ancient Egypt. For example, in Upper and Lower Egypt, they had different gods, as we've already uh, talked about. Upper Egypt, their god was Horus or Nekbet, which is the vulture. Horus is the hawk god. In Lower Egypt, their god was Wajet, which is the snake god. They also had different crowns. In Upper Egypt, they had the Hajet, which is a white crown originated from Taseti, which translates to land of the bow, and this is in modern day Sudan. In Lower Egypt, they had the Deshret, which is a red crown with a snake symbol at the front, representing the god Wajet. And they also had different capital cities. Now, what I would like you to do, the task that I set you, is this. Can you tell where the following leaders came from, Upper or Lower Egypt, based on their depiction? What I want you guys to do is feel free to pause this video, take your time, collate your evidence and argue as to whether or not the emperors or the leaders um, depicted come from Upper or Lower Egypt. Take your time, you can pause this video and whenever you're ready, whenever you've put, full, put forth your points, put forth your discussions as a group, you can then press play and continue the lecture. Alright, it's 5660 BC according to Julius Africanus. A young king named Nama or Menes has come to age of rule in Upper Egypt, or age to rule in Upper Egypt, which is Southern Egypt. Cities such as Hierakonopolis, the capital of Upper Egypt, which was dedicated to the hawk god Horus, boasted great feats. Uh, Hierakonopolis was over two miles long, containing many neighbourhoods. The city also boasted huge populations of city workers, including craftsmen, farmers, officials and priests. Fragments of over 300,000 pots were found in this area. A brewery was found which could have catered to up to 200 people every day. 5,600 years ago, the land around the Nile was partly uninhabitable, and this was due to the Nile's deltas. This is where the Nile would dump earth on the surrounding banks, making it swampland. However, King Nama of Thinis saw an opportunity. Herodotus, the Greek historian, collected information on his visit to the country. Herodotus said that 
the Egyptian priests have said that Mena was the first king of Egypt and that it was he who raised the dike which protects Memphis from the indonations of the Nile. Before his time, the river flowed entirely through the sandy range of hills which skirts Egypt on the side of Libya. By banking up the river at the bend, which forms around 100 furlongs south of Memphis, laid the ancient channel dry, while he dug a new course for the stream halfway between two lines of the hills. Besides these works, the priest said he also built the temple of Vulcan, which stands within the city. This was written by Herodotus 4, 000, sorry, 485 BC. Essentially, Nama saw that the flooding of the land, if controlled or harnessed, could create fertile land for farming and living. He built the banks of the river to enable the water levels to drop and then diverted the river to avoid unwanted flooding. This was achieved over 7,000 years ago and set the foundations for ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian civilization, to thrive. Nama led a campaign to conquer Lower Egypt, Northern Egypt. However, it is debated whether or not this was a peaceful or aggressive takeover. The most well-used evidence around this time is Nama's palette, which we can see here. Can you interpret what is occurring in this palette? I'll give you some hints. My questions to you in this task to, to explore is what did King Nama do? Focus on the following points. The crown he is wearing in the left and the right image. Focus on the animals which are featured. Is Nama posing as an aggressor or as a leader? Which animal combinations can you see? Are they symbolic in any sense to the gods of Upper and Lower Egypt? Is Nama uniting or disbanding Lower Egypt? Feel free to press to pause and then press play when you feel like you've collated your answers. We can see that the king is presented as being larger than his co-features. You can see Horus to the top right of the first palette. Horus is the all-seeing god of the sky and consciousness. All-seeing and all-knowing is also a feature of the Abrahamic god of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. We can also see him wearing a white crown of Upper Egypt, the Hejet. We also see the feature of the swamp plants which are presented in Lower Egypt by the Nile Delta. Horus is dominating these plants as he pulls the nose off of a Lower Egyptian. We can then see Nama lead a victory parade on the right hand side. If you look, you can see his crown has changed. He now wears the crown of Lower Egypt, the Deshvet. When these two crowns are combined, we have the Pshent. Another symbol which is also often used is the unification of Wajet and Nekbet, the snake and the vulture. This is also seen on Tutankhamun's mask to symbolise his rule of Upper and Lower Egypt. We can also see similar symbology in the half lion, half serpent animals intertwining with each other. Pharaoh is the name anointed to the leader of the combined lands of Upper and Lower Egypt. This is why we speak of Nama as the first Pharaoh. He united Egypt, giving rise to the first civilization the world has known, and set the capital in Memphis. He ruled with his wife, Queen Neotep, and their successor, Menith, became the first female to rule a civilization in her own right in history. The Old Kingdom, as described by Julius Africanus in 5717 BC. 
This period came, this period from Mena to the end of the 6th dynasty is called the Old Kingdom. Um, during this period, the Egyptians built the Great Pyramids and wrote the Pyramid Texts. The Pyramid Texts are the oldest known religious texts in the world and provide a beautifully elaborate depiction of ancient Egyptian ethics. There are also striking similarities between the Abraham, Abrahamic religious texts, i.e. Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and the ancient Egyptian religions. The Old Kingdom also saw the origin of the solar calendar, which we still use today, and also writing on papyrus. Remember that we saw the development of civilization very closely follow the development of agriculture because it enabled people to settle and use their time for more specialist tasks. We can view writing on papyrus as creating the same pivotal change. Before written language, spoken language relied on being passed down vocally. This meant that many different languages and dialects could emerge independently, making communication a lot more difficult. With the invention of written language and changing from writing with a chisel and palette to ink and papyrus, communication be could become far more uniform, faster, and literacy rates could increase. Throughout the Old Kingdom, Egypt became increasingly engaged in international trade. Pharaoh Boha succeeded Nama and extended trade links to the Lebanon, or to Lebanon, which is north of Israel, 1,200 kilometers away, and Syria, 1,500 kilometers away. Pharaoh Dije, who succeeded Hoha, promoted scientific exploration. Dr. Charles Finch, a medical doctor who has studied the medical papers from the Old Kingdom, noted that at present, some of these conditions are impossible to detect or describe without x-ray studies. The question arises as to how did our ancient surgeon living and practicing thousands of years ago, how did they manage to diagnose and describe these problems without the benefit of x-ray? His daughter, uh, Pharaoh Mernith, was the first woman in history to own a country in her own right. This didn't happen in England until 1516, when AD, when Mary uh, I took the throne, and this is 7,000 years after Pharaoh Menith. My task to you um, is the, I want you to explore the evolution of communication. Thanks to the ancient Egyptians, we have the first known case of written language. Think about how communication has developed over the past 6,000 years. What I want you to do is list the stages and the benefits of each stage. For example, we've gone from um, spoken word, which is fast and in, doesn't in, in involve too much complicated coordination. We've also got written word on palettes, which enables it to travel further without the individual being there who wrote it. And then we've also got palettes who are, which are long lasting. Um, so what I want you, and we've, we've also got carrier pigeons, which then enable a uh, word to travel faster by carrying text. So these are certain uh, sides or certain um, forms that written word or communication has evolved into. And what I would like you to do is tell me the benefits of different, or list the different stages that you can imagine first over the evolution of written language and spoken language, and tell me the benefits that each stage gives that civilization and the advantages that it gives that civilization.